Hello, I'm Cos Green. Welcome to the program. I am really excited about a brand new children's book that is coming out soon. So we want to talk about that children's book and what I believe will be its impact around the world. Because this book will change lives and help protect hundreds of thousands of children. I really believe that. So today I'm joined by my guest. He wrote uh, The Christmas Box. And if you've never read that before, I highly recommend it. So get a copy of The Christmas Box. It was written a number of years ago and since then, it has sold over 8 million copies. He's also the author of 41 consecutive New York Times bestsellers. Now, if you've ever written a book before, to write one bestseller is quite a feat, but 41 consecutive bestsellers, both fiction and nonfiction, and he's also written a couple of children's books before. So he has over 30 million books in print. Now, here's what we're gonna tie this into today as well. During the fall of 1998, he founded the Christmas Box International, an organization devoted to maintaining emergency shelters, providing services and resources for abused, neglected, and homeless children, teens, and young adults. To date, more than 130,000 children have been served by the Christmas Box House. He lives in Salt Lake City with his wife, Carrie, and have five children and two grandchildren. So friends, Help me welcome my guest today, the one, the only, Richard Paul Evans. Richard, thanks for being here today. Nice intro, thank you. I am <laughs> so excited about this new book. When I saw that you were writing a new children's book, I hadn't realized you'd already written four or five of them. Yeah, yeah, a few of them have been like really big. Um, like The Dance sold a quarter million copies of first year. That's amazing. Now this has an interesting story is, of where this came from. I'm really excited about it. So that. <laughs> let's talk about the story yeah. about Michael and where my son lives in a tree, where the inspiration came from. Yeah, well where it started, um, it, it was the worst summer of my life. And my, my son was in the hospital and uh, there were some really some serious issues that were going on and it was scary. I remember the first time I walked out knowing I wouldn't know when my son would get out of the hospital. I, I walked out and I stopped by the door and I threw up. I, it's like I was so stressed. Physically stressed. Physically stressed. And um, every day I would go to see him. And we finally, his window overlooked the um, parking lot. And he would come up and stand like this. This little boy, right? By the How window. Was he? he was nine. Mm -hmm. And I would drive around the parking lot twice and honk and wave both times. You know, it's like we had this ritual. And, I, and you know, I'd be crying by the time I'd left. And it was such a frightening time. It was, it was a horrible time. And um, one time I'm driving up to see him. And all of a sudden, this poem comes to me. The entire thing, just this whole, it just starts coming to me. And I'm like, wow. And the thing is, usually ideas have about a 30 second shelf life with me, right? <laughs> it's like, that's why I stop and write on paper, sure. you know, envelopes, whatever I can get. And it's like, this one stuck with me. And it's like, what was that? And um, so I shared it with my daughter, Jenna, who's now a international bestselling author too. And I shared it with her and she goes, oh my gosh, that's so sad. And she goes, dad, you know what that's about? And I go, it's just a kid in the zoo, and it's like, no, you wrote about Michael. You wrote, you, you wrote your pain through this. Mm. And all of a sudden, it hit me, it's like, how did I miss that? Well, of course I did. You're, sometimes your, your brain or the spirit, you know, just, it tries to protect you from yourself. And so I looked at it, it's like, oh my gosh, this book, this is about my son. And so, um, can I read it? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's start so, with that. So, so what happened, I, I didn't want to publish it because it was too sensitive, it was too, it was about my son, and he was still struggling, and and, um, and so. But what what I would do, I would share this at book signings, and you know how grateful the Grateful Dead used to have a song, "The Touch of Grey," that they never recorded. They only they only played it at their concerts, gotcha. and they had the huge following until just before they finally, before Jerry Garcia died, they recorded it, and we all got to enjoy it. And so that's what I did with this poem. I would I would share it at every book signing in every city in America. So you would just print it out, or you would no? I would just I would just say it, and the pe everyone went nuts. I mean, people would cry at the end of it. They would laugh. They would. I, I, and it got to the point. It's like I know when something's predictable, right? When they're going to respond, and every time was where do we buy the book? And I said I don't know. I'll know when it's the time to, to publish it. And so um, that's th I did this for more than fifteen years. Really. And and then it just hit me. It's like you know what? It's time. And um, so this is the poem. A week ago, or maybe two, I took my family to the zoo. The day was nice, the sky was blue, seemed to me the thing to do. 
No sooner there I heard a shout, someone's let a monkey out. I turned to see who caused this fuss, the shouter pointed right at us. And then the keeper of the zoo did what it is that keepers do. He grabbed my son, that rotten louse, and locked him in the monkey house. And though I stomped and yelled with rage, he would not let him from the cage. Go ahead and turn the page. Hashtag free the boy, I wrote online. You cannot have this son of mine. I'll call, the, I'll call my lawyer, I'll call the news. Grown boys do not belong in zoos. I fought for him both tooth and nail to free him from that monkey gel, but nothing I did seem to help. I wrote a bad review on Yelp. So every day I went to see my son up in that monkey tree, hoping that I'd get a glimpse, my boy among those smelly chimps. And then one day he dropped on by, swinging wildly from the sky. To my surprise, he looked just fine, clinging to that ropey vine. Don't worry, Dad, my son did say. It's not so bad. I want to stay. In here I do just as I please. I spend my days up in the trees and swinging with the hairy bunch. We eat bananas for our lunch. No mom or dad, not anymore, to tell me not to slam the door or wipe my feet or eat my peas. For snacks, my friends pick out my fleas. No, where's your homework? How's those grades? No, playing till your beds are made. So thank you, Dad, but I'm just fine. Gotta go, here comes the vine. And that is how it came to be, my son now living in a tree. I still don't know when he'll come home, and that is why I wrote this poem. For though he says it's lots of fun, it's not for me. I miss my son. Wow. <laughs> that that is very powerful. <laughs> Imagine that whole thing came to me, just like, just like <sighs> download. So you just transcribed I, it, basically. I, 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 like hours later, I transcribed it. It's like, how did that, I mean, I can't remember it now. It's like, how did I remember all that? And so I just held on to it. And it's like, it was something very special with my son and I. It's like, wow, that was about him. And it was about the experience he was going through. And so uh, finally this year, I thought, you know what? I, I think it's time to publish this. So I, I went to my publisher and I gave it to my agent. I said, let's take, let's, let's bring this book out. This will be special. And she comes back a few days later and she goes, they won't publish it. Really? And I go, why? She goes, it's racist. I go, what? It's racist. I go, how is this racist? I mean, are, are you serious? I go, this is about the love I have for my son. And he said, no, you can't talk about people and monkeys because it's, it's an affront to the African Americans. I go, that is the most racist thing I have heard in a long time. That's a horrible thing to, to say. To make that I said, I said, yeah, I said, that's a horrible thing you just said. I go, no, no. You, and so I thought, have I lost my mind? So, so I sent it to, to a whole bunch of my black readers. Every one of them wanted to buy it. And so then I reached about, back out. I said, is this racist? It's like one just said, a woman in Atlanta, in Atlanta just wrote back, what are you talking about? She goes, I, there's nothing here. And another, um, a 30-year-old man in Phoenix wrote me back and he goes, um, I told him, it's like, this is a story about a father and a son. It's like, to me, it's kind of a masterpiece because it's really about the son pulling away and finding his own identity. And I said, well, some people think it's racist. And he was quiet for a moment. And he goes, I guess people see whatever they want in something. And so I thought, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. I love this poem. I love its meaning, its message. I'm going to self-publish it. And I'm going to give away all my royalties to the Christmas box house to help abuse children of all races. Absolutely. Right? It's like we're going to do good with this. And we're not, we're not going to let this, this little fringe of people try to do virtue signal or whatever they're doing, um, try to dictate this freedom of this. I mean, this is censorship. And it's like I was raised that, this is, that censorship is wrong, that I was raised in a country with free speech and free press. And it's like... I believe in free press as much as I believe in kindness. And we don't have to choose between the two. But people can say things that are offensive, and I'll still defend their right to say it. It's like, but this isn't offensive. This is about love. And, and the fact that it stepped over that far, it just is, it, it annoys me when I start sharing with people. They just jumped on the bandwagon. So all of a sudden, we have hundreds of people that are already just even hearing about it saying, how do we help? We want, it, we want to get this book going. So that's, what, that's where we are right now. It's like, well, I guess I better find an illustrator. And we found this. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> this, in and of itself, is an amazing story. Well, this is kind of, Tell us about how you found yeah, Andy Gatling. I, I mean, I don't mean to sound too fatalistic about this all, but I mean, I'm going through looking and trying to find an artist, and I find this guy. I'm looking through hundreds of artists, like, oh, this guy's fun. It catches the feeling. It's a lot... And then I see this picture. It's like, oh, my gosh, she's already done this of a... 
of a kid. So I, he's in the UK. So I reach out to him in the UK, and he, he writes back, and I, I tell him what I'm doing. And he's like, wow, this would be really great. I'd be, I would love to do this. Um, I can get to it at the end of 2022. He's like, I go, that's not going to work. It's like he was like two years out. He's really good, right? And, and um, I go, I'm sorry, that's not going to work. I go, can I pay you more? Is there any way I can bribe you? It's like, this is an important cause. And I told him more about it. And, and he came back and he goes, I want to do this. He goes, I'll figure this out. I'm going to have to bump some projects and work weekends, but I want to do this book. So Andy came on. He's been fantastic. And, and then what I realized, he, um, that he actually did this, this picture. I said, we can use this for the cover for now. So this isn't the actual cover, but I said, you already have this picture. And I go, what book is that from? He goes, that's kind of strange. It's not from anything. I just felt like I needed to draw this picture of a monkey and a boy. He goes, I didn't use it for anything. I spent a lot of time on it. I just felt this need to do it. I go, this is just really weird. It's like there's something cosmic going on. Yeah, there. something divine there. Yeah. So, I'm, so I, I just, I think it's beautiful. My, my hope and my goal is that we can raise a million dollars for the Christmas box house. And that will give us this foundation so when bad times comes that we can never, we never slow down. We've never have slowed down. But, um, and things are going great for the charity, right? We're celebrating our 25 year anniversary, so this is the perfect time for oh, this. Oh, what a wonderful milestone. Yeah, it, yeah, 25 years. More than 130,000 children have been helped. And, um, you know, it's the real deal. Uh, he asked me, this Andy in, in England, he said, um, do you ever, 25 years, some of those kids are grown up now. I go, yeah, they have. I go, that's very insightful. He goes, do you ever meet them? And I said, as a matter of fact, I was at a book signing back when we had book signings pre-COVID. And um, this, this um, sweet, you know, beautiful mother came with her kids. They're all excited at my book signing. And, and uh, we took pictures together. And I thought, what a nice family, right? And we're about to leave. And she comes up. She whispers in my ear, I'm one of your Christmas box house kids. And I thought, how beautiful that we were able to, um, that she was able, that we were able to facilitate this, this break in the pattern of abuse. That here she has those kids who are obviously healthy and happy and, and, and noisy. You know, it's okay that they, you know, kids who are abused tend to stay pretty low down because they don't want to get hurt. They don't want to be punished. Sure, These protect. kids were clearly were like, hey, I'm important. You know, you could see it. And seeing the, the glow in the mother's eyes, I thought, this is what it's about, that we made a difference in this life. And, you know, 130,000 kids, I, I run into these kids. So as a matter of fact, a lot of high schools do fundraisers for the Christmas Box House. And I haven't been to a high school in three years where kids haven't come up afterwards who have lived there. Really? Yeah. I, I, think, of, think of the numbers. Like every high school. Sure. And I remember I got up in, in this one high school, um, was it Bo like Bonneville High School up in, uh, it, was, it was in. Up north? Near Ogden, yeah. Yeah, Bonneville. And um, I remember I got up and I said, you know, some of these kids that live in the Christmas Box House are your peers. They're in here, this room right now. I go, I guarantee you they're in here right now. And, and then the uh, student body vice president gets up and he stands up after me to kind of end the assembly. He goes, I want to show you something. And he held up this little stuffed animal of a raccoon. He goes, this is Rocky. I got Rocky the day I went in the Christmas box house. Wow. He goes, at the worst time of my life, they were there for me. And I have to say, it was actually a lot of fun. And instead of being scared, I, I, was, I was loved and taken care of. And he goes, I love this place. And, I go, let's, and he goes, let's do a good job, OK? These are my friends. Let's take care of them. And see, look, he's a, vice, he's a student body vice president, and he That's went through this abuse. It's like, it's like, you know what? These are the things that really matter. It's like, okay, we're, we're doing some good here. And, and when I say we, I mean all of us, because it is a community shelter. They're community shelters. The volunteers, we have thousands and thousands of volunteers. It's beautiful. But, you know, these kids, when they don't have parents who love them, you know, like we were talking about before the show, it's like when they don't have someone who loves them, then we have to step in and say, okay, well, we have enough heart. We have room at our table. We have enough love that we can reach out and we can take care of you too. And that's an important thing. And the Utah community has done that. So now we're looking at how to spread nationally because a lot of people, we have helped in five other states. We are international. We do help in different ways. We've helped hands-on in big ways in five other of their mountain area states. But now people are saying, you know, how do we reach out nationally? And so we're looking at how to grow and to take our model you know, which is really smart. I'm really, I'm really proud of it. 86.5%, 4%, according to our last audit, goes to the kids' programs. 
That's amazing. 86.4%. So 15% to run this thing. And For brick and mortar yeah, and everything. staff 15% and materials. 15% to run that is kind of crazy. And to, and to even raise money and all that stuff. We, everyone, we have the best staff. Everyone's taking a pay cut from where they came from. Every single one of them. Because they believe in the they mission. They believe in the mission. In fact, our executive director, actually, she was um, trafficked as a child. Wow. She has been through the system. And she's absolutely lovely. Her name is Celeste Edmonds. She was my assistant when I started the Christmas Fox House. And she's now, has great, it's like, it's fun because she went off into corporate America. She's worked with Robert Redford. She's, she was named Marketing Woman of the Year. She's done these amazing things. And now she came home. And I called her. I said, you know what? We're changing things to the Christmas Fox House. Why don't you come home? And she goes, I would be honored. And I said, you get, I can't afford you. She goes, I don't care took a major pay cut to come work, come back to you. I want to do something that makes a difference in this world and to give back for all the people who are good to me during these hard days. So it is, I just cause, I just feel like, I feel like God's at the will. I mean, the things that are happening with this, and so, and if, you know, if people are listening to this right now and they want to be involved, um, they can go online, they can go on to My Son Lives in a Tree, and we'll put a link on here with the, um, um, in fact, Diane, maybe you could help them get a link on there. Then you can just click on it and go right to it. And we're, we are pre-selling. The book doesn't come out to this fall. And we're doing it because it's self-published, which means we need to raise a lot of money <laughs> to print the books in advance. But we think we have a bestseller here. And um, we think we're going to be able to raise a lot of money for the Christmas box house. But it's fun to read to your kids. It's, I read it to my grandchildren. They laugh. They, they get nervous about the boy in the zoo, actually. <laughs> Yeah, what happens they to the boy like, in the zoo? Like, wait, you can't put him in there. Yeah, just watch him. It's like you can't put him. You can't put him in the zoo. You got to get him out. You know, you see him kind of go through all the emotions. But and, it's a great story, like you're talking about, that ultimately our children do grow up, and we have to let them go, right? That's probably the hardest thing for all of us as parents. Let's go back to the Christmas box house for just a minute. When you were on Cause TV a few months ago, you told a story that I think is profound, that really shows your commitment to what you're doing. Your board of directors actually gave you the advice, shut that thing down, it was losing yeah. money. Can you take us back to that and how inspiration led you through that dark night of the soul and really saw you through? I think that's a powerful story here. Okay, yeah, I, the Christmas box house was misery when I started it. You didn't like it. Oh, I hate right? it, right? I, I, no, I loved it, I loved the idea. You loved the concept. But it was only an idea. <laughs> we weren't positive it would work and most people didn't think it would. Was. So here we launch out to build a million and a half dollar facility that will could house thousands of children, and um, we're getting ten dollar donations, seven dollar donations. Like, so I'm paying for all of this from your money from from my books. own money for the books. Yeah. And pretty soon I run out of money, so I go out and start getting loans. And my wife's getting pretty nervous about this, and um, and finally it's like. I am, I am strapped here. And so one day we go into have our board meeting and things are just not going well. Every day was seeing And at like this point, bad. you're not enjoying it. Oh, I'm hating it. It's like, it's like okay, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm in debt. And what if I don't write any more books? I'm actually, this thing's going to bankrupt me. And my, I, my accountant actually called me. He goes, you know, you're, you're, you're bankrupting yourself, Rick. I go, no, your, your heart's bigger than your, than your, your, than thought, your, bank your, your thoughts here. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, you, you, need to, you need to back off. He goes, in fact, it may be too late. And um, it's like, you know, I got to have faith here. And, and so I go in this meeting, and my dad, um, who was working on the, on the board, he goes, I'd like to, before the meeting starts, this board meeting, I'd like to say something. And we had the executive director from the facility, there, uh, the future facility there. And he goes, I'd like to make a motion that we disband this, this board and shut down the Christmas box house. I'm like, what? And no, we, and we're like a year and a half into this, right? Just pushing. There's nothing. We haven't broken ground or anything. And it's like, what? And he goes, he goes, yeah, this isn't working. We hope that the community would get involved and help. And it's like, frankly, this is bankrupting my son. And it's more than we ever asked. He's working a lot on this. And it's like, we need to just shut it down in his best interest. And in the interest, is probably not going to work. And I just sat there. I was stunned. It's like I was ambushed. And a part of me honestly was like, what a relief that would be. Mm. You know, what a relief. And so I looked around the table. And I said, are you... Do you all agree? Have you been talking about this, you know, when I wasn't here? And they're like, and uh, I looked at the director. And I go, hey, do you think we need to shut this down? He's like, yeah, it's not going to work. It's like, wow. 
That wasn't what I expected this morning when I walked in. And I said, um, just a minute. And I get up and I walk out of the room and I go into a utility closet where the uh, water heater is, right? The only place I can have any privacy in my office. And I go in there, I kneel down next to the water heater and I say, God, can I be done? Okay, I did my best, you know, we put it out there and can I just, can I be done now? This hurts. And um, I got a very distinct answer. And you know, whether you believe in divine intervention or not, but it just, these words came to my mind so clear and so external and just said, if you fail, no one will ever succeed. Didn't say yes or no, didn't give me an answer, just say, if you fail, no one will ever succeed. It's like, oh, darn. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like, so I walked back. Because you were looking to get off the I, I was hoping, yeah. yeah. It's like, that'd be, yeah. that'd be nice. And so I go back in the room, and I, I go, no, guys, we're not going to shut this down. I go, if you would like to resign, you can resign. And the director goes, Rick, you don't know what you don't know. I've been in this industry for 40 years. You've already lost. You just don't know it yet. The ship is sinking. Rick. Mm. The ship is sinking. And I just looked at him, and I said, and I guess I'm going down with it. And he didn't know what to say to that. It's like, are you just a fool? It's like, you know, it's okay. And I said, so if you'd like to resign otherwise, let's get to work. And my dad said, all right, let's go. And, it, and everything didn't just get easy right then. There was well, you still, still had to struggle. convince your wife. Well, that was a different thing. Yeah, that was, that was bad too. And this is, I mean, this is where I know God's involved with it, okay? Because what happened during this is, I mean, one night I come home, and it just had more bad news. It seemed like it was always bad news. Like, really? I, I, my motto back then was, no good deed goes unpunished. It's like, why can't I get a little I help that here? I, why can't I get a little help here? It's like, sure. I'm, I'm, it's like there's, there's not a selfish bone in my body on this. I, people think I'm an idiot. I'm using all my money. Maybe I am an idiot. It's like, we, we believe we can make a difference here. And so uh, one night I come home, some more bad things have happened, and I get in a fight with Carrie, my wife. And Carrie's like, you spent all of our money. And Carrie's not about money, okay? That's not her. She goes, and no one appreciates it, and it's not going to work. They're not rallying like you hoped. It's like, Rick, you've got to let it go. And it's like, what can I say? She goes, this is killing you, and it's killing us, the pressure on us. And, and the only thing I'd promise is I would not mortgage the house, double mortgage the house, to pay for this because I didn't want her on the street, right? And it's like, and I go, um, it's, there's nothing more to say. It's sad. It's like I was already in pain, and then this happened, and I go downstairs, and I'm just a broken man. And I kneel down, and I go, God, I can't do it. I go, it is hard enough. Every, it is hard. You know how hard this is. You know how I'm struggling. You know how much painful this is. This is not fun. This isn't what I signed up for. I said, but without my wife, I can't do it. And this is her money, too. I go, you, I can't take that, too. That's too much. You gave me too much. And it was fascinating how he answered that prayer immediately. Um, not in a way I thought he would, okay, or even thought about it. It's like what happened is an hour later, I'm in my cave hiding, right? And I get a, te I get a um, intercom message from Carrie. She goes, Rick, Michael's sick. And Michael was nine months old. He's like, he has a fever. So I come upstairs, he has 102 fever. And so we start watching him, and it goes up to 103. And then an hour later, it's 104. It's like, we got to get to the hospital. We know what's wrong. And so it's like, okay, put everything aside. We're going to the hospital. So we drive up to, to uh, Primary Children's. And it's, it's late. At this point, it's 1 in the morning. Okay, it's dark in there. We go in, and we're, Carrie's holding, you know, Michael like this. And we walk down the hall, and we sit down in these two chairs. They're like this, and there's a little wall right here. And we sit down, and uh, just waiting to see the doctor with our sick son. And just then a social worker from DCFS walks in carrying a two-year-old child, just a little older than our son, who had just been beaten up. And he walks in, and it was the strangest thing, because he walked in, and he stood right in front of my wife like this, not looking at her, it's like we were invisible, holding the baby in front of her. And here's a baby with blood running down his head. His hair had been yanked out, so he had just little patches of hair. And the child was about and the two, child right? was about two years old, had been so severely beaten, bruised and everything. And what happens, the nurse comes over, stands next to me, and the counselor tells everything what he knows has happened to this child who's been severely beaten by the mother's boyfriend. And Carrie's in there, and she is just crying. She's like looking at hold her baby, and here's someone else's baby, almost the same age, and she is just crying. She's just like, oh, my gosh, who could have hurt that child like that? And then I go, sir, he looks over like he sees me for the first time. He goes, oh. I go, 
I'm Richard Paul Evans. Um, I don't know if you know who I am, but I've been working with DCFS. Where do you go at, at 1, 2 in, in the morning with this baby? And he goes, I'll start waking people up. He goes, we'll just start calling people and see if someone will take this child after we're done with the doctor. He goes, if we had your facility, the Christmas box house, we would have a place to go right now. And it was, it was fascinating. Then he, then he walks away. And we're just sitting there. And here is Carrie. Look how this lesson was so perfect. She's sitting there. She, she just sits there. She's crying. She has her head down. She's crying. And she turns to me. She goes, build the shelter. Build it. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what we have to give. Build the damn shelter. <laughs> and it's like, at that moment, it's like, oh, my gosh. God is so wise. The way that happened, there's no other way I could have convinced her. She saw firsthand. God said, you need to see what you're doing. You need to see what we're talking about. There are children out there who are being hurt and abused and have no place to go. And when she saw the first hand, she goes, whatever it takes. And the thing is, things didn't get all easy, but she never, she was completely true to that. She became this big cheerleader for it and supportive in every possible way. She was always supportive. She has a huge heart. But now she's like, I get it. And I'm, I'm going to support you, Rick, as much as you can through this hard thing. And, um, you know, 25 years later, we look back, and now it's all joy. The kids that have been through there could fill stadiums. In fact, we did the numbers. The number of kids that have been in there would fill uh, Madison Square Garden more than six times. Wow. That, that puts it in perspective. You know, I look back, and so the things we suffered at the time and the risk we took, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You're dealing with that many kids? It's like, and I'm just so grateful we didn't give up. It's like I had the, oper I had the choice. But I also knew that I would fail, that it would never happen, and that children would die because of my choice. And I now see that very clearly. And it's, it's um, what a blessing, you know? So to tie this in, like with all we're doing, things are going really well. We're expanding now. More people are coming to us. We have 52 partners we provide for, that we provide. How do you mean that you we provide, provide for the partners? We provide clothing, we provide things for, for kids, because we become, our charities become so popular that we actually have a warehouse full of toys and things. We provided Christmas for almost 3,000 kids last Christmas. And, and that's in the middle of COVID. And they were nice toys, Legos. We're talking about Legos. Like, kids love Legos. They're a nice Parents toys. Parents hate Legos yeah. in the middle of the night. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> but nice but toys kids love Legos. and clothing and experiences for the kids. All these wonderful things are coming out. So we're able to, we're, you know, we're in the chance that our goal is how do we serve people who are serving children? We serve children, then how do we serve those? We have wonderful relationships with the state and the county. We're probably one of the few public-private partnerships in history that have worked. Mm. And that, um, but th the reason is our mindset is, what can we do to help you? And we just, we just drill that down. If they're doing the work, uh, if they're doing good. In fact, you did a, um, I think you did a fundraiser a while back for a family that they were working with tra anti -tra counter trafficking, mm -hmm. and he has a death threat. You know, he was given a death threat. Some of the guys we work with are in that same realm. And you reached out and said, "How do we help you? When you find good people, they need your help. They need to know that they're loved, and, and that they there's nothing worse than people sitting around silently just watching people who are doing good and don't lift a hand." Okay, so let's go back to something you said, because I've had this experience, but then I also have those divine experiences that keep me going. Because you said, no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that philosophy and how that changed for you. That you're willing to go through the, the deed being punished, so to speak, for the big picture of what happens. Because it's not easy to serve. It's not easy to love. It's not popular to go through the darkness with people. Right? And I think 90% of life is just showing up. Right? You don't need to know all the answers, but be there for people. Yeah. You've been there for people. But sometimes you don't see the fruits of your labor. Now, looking back 25 years later, you can say, yeah, we've filled Madison Square Garden six times with the children we've served. But in the moment, what kept you going? Yeah. Sometimes when we, you're in the midst of that. Faith? You know, I have a very, I, I feel I have a relationship with God. Whoever my muse is who gives me my books, okay, I have had those moments that are so rare and so miraculous when things, like the poem, are just downloaded to me. It's like, this is what I want you to say. I know there's something there. I trust that. And sometimes it scares me because I also know it will let me suffer. 
Okay, before the Christmas box hit it big, I thought I had lost everything. I told Carrie we were going to lose our home. Everything went wrong. And it's like, I know it will let me suffer, but I also look back and it's like, thank you for these moments that I can be dignified, that I can show, that I can show true nobility to say, the ship's going down, but I'll stay on the ship. So you suffered in grace. Yep. And I think that's the key, right? Well, if, if you pray, you know, who was it? Uh, Dr. Victor Frankel. Who wrote, who wrote, may we be worthy of our sufferings. Wow. And most people don't even, you know, most, most of the greatest suffering that happens, happens in private. Absolutely. My greatest moments with the Christmas box were not when the book hit number one, and I'm on the Today Show and all that. The greatest moments were sitting in a, sitting in a parking lot after being kicked out of a bookstore and, th and realizing that um, my book was going to fail. And it's like, and still light went on. And that's to me, it's like, it's like C.S. Lewis said something once that has impacted me from my childhood, I'll never forget. He said, nowhere is the cause of danger or the cause of evil more threatened than when a man knelt to a cross, looks up new heavens, say, why have you deserted me? But still he goes on. And I thought, I want to be that kind of man that no matter what, knelt to, knelt to whatever cross that might be given me to say, all right, but still I'll go on. And um, it's hard and it's painful. And so many times I feel like a failure and, and feel like um, unworthy. Um, but, you know, like last time I was watching a documentary on Confucius, he died kind of like nothing. This is a man who actually changed the lives of billions of people. Confucius did more to affect China than Buddha than anyone. And I've lived, I have a daughter who's Chinese. I speak Chinese. And to understand the culture, it's Confucian. Everything, it is based on Confucius. He died never realizing. It was more than 100 years later that all of a sudden people started to realize that this man had given them ingredients for a peaceful society and to bring peace. And it took, it took a long time. He never saw that. And, and, and that, I can look at that, it's like, am I that strong? I don't think I am. You, you know, I, to be able to do that and say, do the right thing just because it's the right thing, even if you're punished for it, those, those are the kinds of people that I totally admire and don't think, I would like to be that kind of person. And I, I don't want to be tested, though, because I like, I like a comfortable life, right? I like, you know, I don't want to be Gandhi. <laughs> it's like, really, I, <laughs> right. I, I actually like having, ha having a, you know, a modest but a nice life. And sure. Go out to dinner when I want, you know? So anyway, that's, but there is that kind of philosopher in me that I look at. And also just because um, I, I have really strong feelings about, about God. I mean, I... When he's done with me writing, I mean, I've never taken credit, credit for my books. And when he's done with me writing, I'm done. It's like, because of that. When he per, turns it off. When it turns off, he I'm turns done. it off. It's like, huh? Yeah, there's no question. It's like, I'm done. The download stops. Yeah, it's like, okay. Yeah, it went to someone else. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's my philosophy. And, I, and, and, you know, I'm sure there's some psychiatrists out there looking and saying I'm deluded. And it's like, whatever. But that's, as long as you, you, know, you may not believe me, but as long as you believe that I believe this, it's okay. Absolutely. Right. And especially in this day of cancel, uh, the cancel culture and just can I really be me because somebody might not like me or I might not be validated for what I believe. More than ever before, you and I and people that believe in what we believe in terms of one person can make a difference. Now is the time to shine brighter than ever because the world needs us more than ever before. Yeah. And so even if someone you know, doesn't like what you said or they don't like your post or whatever you're doing, I would just say to everyone who's viewing today, stay the course. Keep shining brightly because someone out there needs to be guided by your light. And you've got to stay the course. And it's going to have a lot of darkness perhaps on your journey. But believe in yourself. Believe what's possible. If, like Richard's saying, if you have the faith to keep on keeping on when it's tough, great things will happen. And it might not be for 25 years that you can look in the rear view of the mirror and say, we've helped 130,000 children. Something tells me as well there's another 130,000 children or more out there to help that we need to help through the, the Christmas box house rather, helping the children of the Christmas box house. And this is gonna be an integral part. Yeah. So let's, let's wrap up. My son lives in a tree.com is where yep. we go. Tell us a little bit more about this process then, because so, so I went on and bought four copies you of the did, book. Thank and you did, thank you. Tell our viewers so, how this is going to work. So you can buy one copy, 
And um, again, all my royalties, 100%, go to the Christmas Box house. Um, you could buy two copies in their autograph. Three by one. you, by me. I just autograph by anybody. I, I, I right? autograph you. Um, let's 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 wear out his arm. What do you say we get him to autograph a million books? Absolutely. Right? And you, then, you would do that. Yeah, I would. Absolutely. I once did twelve hundred books in fifteen minutes. Wow! I saw the video. You did time lapse, right? <laughs> they were bringing them in on the yeah, out, yeah. out of the boxes, and you were just well. well I did a Michael Vay signing. We had four thousand kids, so that was insane. In so your life. your signature but has gone from Richard Paul Evans. It was to, never that. It was just it was, R. It was always <laughs> yeah, it was a mess. So, um, but yeah, if you go there, go to um, my son lives in a tree. Or um, we'll put a link on here afterwards. Uh, then you just click on it and go there. They can also um, we have a, a one thousand dollars. And that's, you know, that's almost completely tax deductible. And you get 10 books. You get 10 little stuffed monkeys with the Christmas Box House logo. And I will call your house or Zoom your house and read the book to your child. Wow. <laughs> so that's for, we already had someone do that already, which really? is awesome. Yeah, so um, however we can, again, however we can help and build this. But this is a cause. If, if you believe in this cause, you know, what we're doing in defending children, and also the, the idea of the poem and the love of a parent for a child, which is just like my first book, The Christmas Box, is about the love of a parent for a child. Then let's, you know, let's get behind this. Let's make it the number one book in America. And uh, let's make something big happen. So come on as a, as a warrior. Join our group and come on and say, I want to help. Well, and I read this poem three different times, kind of you know, spaced repetition. And I got something dif different out of that poem each time. So it's interesting the meaning that can be garnered from this poem. And so just to summarize and emphasize, the book will be illustrated by Andy Catling. So it will be a children's book with just the most amazing illustrations to go along with this poem that basically Richard transcribed divinely a few years ago when Michael was in the hospital. So mysonlivesinatree.com, mysonlivesinatree.com. Go now, buy advanced copies of the book. Let's help fund this process of publishing this book because frankly, a big publisher didn't want it. Yeah. And so you believe in this, you believe in what you're doing and collectively working together, we can make great things happen. So, Richard, any final thoughts about my son lives in a tree and why we should all be warriors in this cause together? Yeah, this is a, we're, it's so fun to have a movement right now, to be involved with something. It's something you feel good about. Um, you know, the freedom of, of press is important to me. Um, but at the core, it's, it's about love, <laughs> you know, and it's about love for a child. And, you know, anyone who has a child that they've worried about will understand this. And so someone wrote me the other day, they bought several copies and they said, you know, my son never came out of the zoo. Hmm. You know, it's like I went through that, but he never left the hospital alive. And it's like, thank you so much. It's really touched me. And, you know, that kind of thing is just beautiful. And it's like to be able to share this and hopefully help. And then they say, let's take this and let's help these kids who um, really are, I, I mean, I guess we can say they're kind of in the, in the, in the treehouse, right? They're in the sure. Christmas box house. They, they've, sure. they've left their homes. And let's, let's do good. Let's do something good with this that's positive. And if this sold, my Christmas box sold 8 million copies. Could you imagine if this sold 8 million copies, Christmas box house would be able to impact the entire nation, impact millions of children. And that's the goal. That's the mission. Yeah. Christmas box house has influenced and protected 130,000 130, children over the last 25 years. Richard's not done. The mission of the Christmas box house is not done. There's at least another 130,000 children out there to be protected and to, to help. And there's, there's millions. And each one of us needs to do our part. And so we hope you'll go to mysonlivesinatree.com. Get your advanced copies now. Let's rally around this. I like what you said. It's a movement. Yeah, let's share it on it's your page. It's a movement. If you're watching this on Facebook, share it on your page. Reach out to your friends and say, look, I want you to see this. This is important. Join me on this cause. Yeah, it's a, that, and even if you don't have the money to do it, and some people don't, you know what? Posting it, sharing it is as good as a donation, right? And sometimes even better because you don't know who that's going to get to. And what will be interesting is at the bottom of this video, if you share it, Every time you share it and it gets a view, that will keep a tally. So let's get hundreds of thousands of views to this discussion today 
with author Richard Paul Evans about the book, My Son Lives in a Tree. Let's share this with as many people as possible. And if you're watching, watching this months into the future, continue to share this. Let's get behind this movement of the Christmas box house and save and protect children. Richard, always a pleasure to visit and spend you're, time you're, with you. You're a great interviewer, thank you. Thank you, and thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. My son lives in a tree.com. Go there and get involved today. Subscribe to Cause TV and listen to the Cause Green audio experience on iTunes and Spotify.